on hey everyone how's it going it is i the real randy chavez coming at you today with dr amanda doran veterinarian which minnesotan minnesotian I, I, I don't know how do you say that potato tomato i think it's okay <laughs> gotcha. and when you uh did you grow up there where did you uh where were you born oh you did yeah i've lived kind of all over like this area like um born in central minnesota right now i live in Duluth, which is like the furthest inland seaport, very interesting. So we get like ships are driven by you sometimes. Um, I lived in Canada for a while and kind of all over this area. <laughs> so, so I was talking to Facebook a little bit and saw that you, you had spent some time in Canada as well, right? Yes. Okay. So the Canada, did you move there for work? Did you move yeah. there? You, you did? Yeah, so my first job outside of school as a veterinarian was up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and even like Canadians think that's the middle of nowhere, but yeah. on the same big lake that I'm living on now. So for the oh, that's, for the uh, boards there, is it you can just pass one board for the whole country, or is it like the United States, where each state you have to pass like your own veterinary board? Yeah. So national one like the boards that like everybody takes like um north of Vet north american veterinary licensing i think is what it takes is what it's called and then um yeah each state and each province have their own test that you just had to go down to toronto and take the little test there in order to get my license and we're actually like right across the river wisconsin so now, like back in the States, I'm licensed in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, Danielle's working on her license in, I think, Florida and Pennsylvania. You know, she's practiced in New York forever, but uh, that's where she's got a place in over in uh, in Pennsylvania in the Poconos. And hope yeah. we move down to Florida where it's warmer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is not. Uh, I, don't, I don't like the winter here, but you, you seem like a snowbird. You really love... Uh, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, so you really like the cold? You really like the winter? I like, I like all the seasons. And I do, as I get older, I do understand, like, why people snowboard. Like, a lot of older people will take off for several months of the year. Um, yeah. yeah, at least for now, like, I do, like, like, each season is so different here. Like, Minnesota is, like, the most beautiful place on the planet, like, in summer. <laughs> and then... Like in the winter, it kind of keeps the riffraff out. Like we don't have like poisonous snakes or like scorpions or like stuff like that. And yeah, also in the back of my what's oh, backwards than usual, I have a little wood stove right here. And so like that's also like my favorite thing in the whole world is like hubby like making little like fire and then, like snuggle up with the blanket and the dogs and yeah. so outdoor recreation, um, cross country skiing, snowshoe, yeah. ice fishing. <laughs> okay, so you had originally you had moved for work, you had come back down. Mm -hmm. Where in there did you get introduced to witchcraft, and where in there did you find yourself taking a liking to it? Well, I don't think really as a child that I ever really like grew out of the like magical phase of like yeah. digging like unicorns and dragons and stuff like that. And I remember playing this game with my siblings when I was a kid called Tale of the Crystals, where like you're magical healers and you fight this like wicked witch lady. And I think in a lot of ways it felt like it was kind of a part that I couldn't like let people like really know about. Like it had to be like a secret, you know, because you yeah. can't be a reputable scientist and veterinarian and also like like witchy things um, was the story that I told myself. But I think really so I've been a veterinarian for just about 10 years. My first job up in Thunder Bay was about four and a half, five years. And I really struggled with it, like mental health wise, because just worked like all the time. And it's really, and you probably know this too, like it's very like emotionally like difficult job. And I didn't really like do a lot of stuff outside of work. I found myself like really needing to like have something. And so I started taking just like this, like online class from like cute ladies in England who are called like the Edge Witch Kitchen or something like that. Okay. Which is, like teas and tinctures and stuff. But, I mean, I was definitely like a goth teen and like spent a lot of time at like Hot Topic and like, <laughs> like same. Oh, you're right. And, like, 
Um, but I also, also I always felt like it was really this, like, almost like Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. Like, well, people aren't going to take me seriously as a veterinarian, like, if they know that, like, I have bonfires and howl at the moon sometimes, you know? Um, but it's just not true. And I found, like, the more that I started to, like, learn more about plants and, like, you know, the cycles of the moon and, like, tarot and astrology, like, the happier I was in my work, even though, like, I mean, I don't do, like, rituals and things, like, while I'm working. Yeah. Um, but, like, yeah, the more I integrate it together, like, the happier. So, I don't know. I feel like kind of always, but secret for a while, like, kind of coming out of the broom closet here now. <laughs> so, so you said you got into astrology and, like, t- tarot, like, tarot cards. Mm-hmm. Is, does that have anything to do with personalities of animals? Like, can you go and see, oh, hey, this dog is also a Gemini, or this dog is also... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I never really thought of it like that. Um, I don't know. I guess all critters do kind of have their own, like, personalities. I think in some ways, too, like, they almost kind of become, like, like reflections of us. Like, not necessarily, like, directly, but, you know, kind of based on, like, genetics and, like, environment. Like, there's definitely, like, different, like, archetypes, maybe, and, like, different, like, personalities. But I don't think you can say, like, ah, oh, this dog is a Gemini or whatever. Uh, and I think there's like a misconception about astrology and tarot too, thinking that it's like future predicting, but I feel like it's almost like unconsciously reflecting, like in one way. Like the when you look in the newspaper and like here's like the sun, but that's like one out of like a million pieces of the puzzle. And you know, there's like twelve of them only. And so like that's just like a little thing. And so you know, it's kind of like so to answer your question. I'm not sure if you can <laughs> check tarot or check astrology and know animals, yeah. archetypes. I'll pay more attention to that and asking. Okay. So you said that originally you didn't really want to like mix the two. You didn't want to let like clients know that you were also a practicing witch. When did you start and uh, telling people like coming out of like the witch closet and saying, oh yeah, by the way, I do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I guess it's not really something that I like, go around preaching like it's definitely more of like a personal thing and I think there is a big difference between like identifying yourself a witch and as a witch and like calling someone else one and I think a lot of times in our society still like we kind of get this like negative like malevolent kind of connotation with calling someone a witch um yeah, I guess so like as my career evolved I started kind of moving away from general practice and now I do um, exclusively in home euthanasia, and I found, like, I kind of needed something else to do in addition to that because it was such intense work, and so I started doing some more, like, writing and public speaking and other stuff, and just found that when I came at it only from, like, this very, like, intellectual, like, scientific kind of perspective, like, it it didn't feel right. Like, there was a missing piece, and, like, and kind of start to like integrate this and like identify myself as a witch, not necessarily like run around telling people I'm a witch, um, but really kind of taking in more of those like kind of like psychological and like spiritual aspects and like tying that in with the science. Like definitely found like oh like this is magic. Like kind of being conscious about like your intentions and so yeah and. I started like a little like online side business, like making candles and soaps, and like that's called the like, Wicked Witch of the West End. It's a little like a little salty, like a little tongue in cheek. Um, but I'm gonna have like a little farmers market um, stand, and it's just kind of been like this cool way to like interact with like cool people. Like I think a lot of the people who identify themselves as witches are usually um, pretty like confident ladies who like to like do moony stuff and like. I don't know, same kind of stuff I do. And so I feel like it's kind of been a way to like connect to more of an audience that I relate with as opposed to like the one I think I should be. I think a lot of people who like are kind of in the veterinary business world are like, well, you can't really talk about that stuff. Like you're going to lose people. And it's like, well, maybe yeah. those are my people. Like maybe like this calling is a little higher than just like veterinary medicine. So I feel like, yeah, as I like, kind of embrace that more, like I find like inhabiting like this larger sense of self and like, reaching other people who aren't necessarily like in the field. And um, I'm, I'm a storyteller. Like I really like characters and mythology and like, Same. yeah, I think like a lot of the thing I like to do is like 
as I've learned how to retell my story is like help other people learn how to like retell their stories. And so I feel like it's really kind of like in some ways like a symbol of like self empowerment too. And kind of saying like ah like here are some things I can control and that's like the words that I say to myself about like the feelings that I have and like helping other people retell their stories. So I feel like that kind of ties in with that too and just it almost feels like brand archetype kind of like <laughs> so what are some of the common misconceptions that people have about witches or people that you know do practice that um so i feel like historically it has a pretty like, negative like malevolent connotation like this is like an old moly woman who like cast spells on people and lives in a chicken leg house and <laughs> like um yeah that people you know, do black magic or like worship Satan or like all all sorts of things that I think just a lot of them aren't true. And I think a lot of those older stories were kind of used to like outcast people and further other agendas where yeah, I think a lot of people who identify as witches like they're in touch with nature and like kind of aware of like natural cycles and like animals and like having that kind of close experience like with the natural world um and so i feel like there's kind of been i don't know maybe over the last like several centuries like kind of a shift in like how that word is used and i think yeah a lot of times when people identify themselves like that's not what they mean but i think sometimes when people identify others as which is like it's not always like with like wise intention <laughs> Yeah. So in the years that you've been doing this, have you picked up any type of skills or talents that some might consider to be unnatural or some might consider to be a little out of left field? Um, just like in general, I don't know. I think. Hmm say this i feel like i've always been like a really like intuitive person like mm -hmm. we have like two sides of our brain right left brain and right brain and like one is like the intellectual stuff the logical stuff like logic and lines and like categories and then like our society is kind of based on that side of the brain and then the other is kind of more like the realm of like intuition and imagination and like kind of more abstract thought and like feelings and I feel like I really had to like cut self off from that and as we kind of going forward and like um kind of like rejoining these parts myself, I feel like that intuition has gotten a lot deeper and like it's helped me be more like present but I like I can't like predict the future like I don't think anybody really can like even meteorologists like how do those people still have jobs like they're wrong all the time um yeah. Or like, you know, can't like move objects with my mind or like bippity boppity boo kind of stuff. Like that'd be pretty all right. Um, yeah, I think just the kind of this like deeper intuition and like more like power to be in the present moment. And I think all those uh, those aren't really like supernatural things. Like I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't do or can't do. Yeah. And, yeah. So I'll, go ahead. So in the in the last couple of years, uh, have you noticed, you know, with the pandemic and people staying home, have you noticed an uptick of people uh, coming into this practice of people going into this this form of art? This form of like the witchy stuff? Yeah. Have, have you noticed that as opposed to like, oh, there's, you know, normal people come out every year. But now, you know, since 2020 maybe since people had more time, a lot more people are practicing. Maybe. And I think like, it's not really like an organized thing. Like there's not really like, like rules about it. There's not like one book that like everybody follows. And I think maybe since I've been doing it more, like I've been more people, but I don't know if there's maybe more people like doing it out. Maybe like, it doesn't seem like there's a lot more like books and stores and like podcasts and just people kind of talking more about it. I think we've all had a lot of time <laughs> on our own, like to be doing 
reflection about things, but yeah, it does seem like maybe, I think it's even like the last like, 10 or 20 years too. Like, you know, back in the day, like nobody really talked about it. I mean, there was like the Wizard of Oz witches and like Bewitched, and like, remember, like in the 90s, watching like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And yeah, like, I, love <laughs> I love that show. Um, you know, like movies like, um, like Practical Magic and Charmed and like The Craft and like Charmed, so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it almost kind of seems like there has been this gradual shift where more people are kind of identifying with this symbol or like this archetype and like it's showing up more in stories and not always that like cackling evil which wicked witch of the west like it does seem like more and more um like women and people who identify as women and men too like there's certainly like wizards and warlocks out there um yeah maybe like it's becoming safer to identify with these ideas, like less likely to be burned at the stake that may have been like 150 years ago or so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the times of the crucible, I, it's a good book. Uh, is there any type of, I guess not celebrity, but I guess fictional character like Scarlet Witch or Doctor Strange that you'd be like, oh, these people, they represent what I'm about? <laughs> um, I feel like I have to go back to like earlier years. Like I was like waiting for my like Hogwarts letter for like <laughs> years, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, yeah, I don't know if there's like a particular character. I feel like there's as many kinds of like witches that one could be as there are like, people who identify as them. And yeah, I know, I guess like, for me, I kind of see it as like, how do I like connect to nature, like speak my truth and like know lots of stuff and like super into like psychology and like mythology and like spirituality. And so I don't know, like, Maeve's Hermione, you know, like little time Turner kind of thing going on, like oh, yeah. the library and like, <laughs> these kind of things. But. So in the, there, there's a interview with, uh, Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox, and I, I have a point to bring in this out, but mm -hmm. they said that they every now and then will drink each other's blood. Mm -hmm. There, the that part of the interview is a little taken out of context. I don't know if it's a ceremonial thing, but what is one thing or a, any number of things that you might do that's considered normal that other people might be like, okay, a little weird, and then why is it normal? Oh, to each their own, I suppose. Um, I've n I've never drank anyone's blood or like my own blood. Like that's that's not really my jam. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's not normal. Like, how do you even know like what's not normal about you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I do make like little um. Like I have an altar and like I make like little like spell jars or like spell bags. And so, yeah, I guess like sometimes I do kind of like ongoing rituals where like I'm trying to, you know, maybe there's like a certain like goal I have or like a deity that I'm trying to invoke. And like I'll have like a little bag or like a little jar and I'll put like little things in it like um, like coins or like pieces of paper with like wishes or intentions on them or um like little crystals or just like little like found things and like I guess for lack of a better word like pray at that altar and like wish and hope for things from the universe like probably not everybody does that yeah. um, <laughs> but so, again, so is that your version of speak what you want as if it were like you can write something down put it in like a hex bag and then mm -hmm. uh try to will it into the universe that way yeah, I suppose. And like, I think the other thing when I think about like magic and wishes and like storytelling and like speaking and writing, like our words that we choose are the power that or, like, the power that we have. Like, that's where our power comes from. And so they also say like, you know, focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. Because like the thoughts you have will become your actions and your behaviors. And like that's like you know, as above or below, like your internal world like, reflects your outer world. And so also like therapy, like being aware of like those stories that I tell myself and like kind of what my intentions are. And also kind of realizing like sometimes like you shake the apple tree and you get oranges and like you 
you don't always get exactly what you want, um, but sometimes maybe it's even better. And I um, also think like we're all kind of doing magic all the time. So like some people will say like, oh, be careful what you wish for. It's like, well, no, no, don't be careful what you wish for because like you're you're wishing for things like all the time, even though you may not realize it. Like we are are living our like what is a dream like right now, um, and yeah, kind of imagining like what do you want for that future like, what is the next step as opposed to just kind of like staying stagnant and like not like having goals like helps you have I think meaning and purpose and yeah I think it's there is power in it and like kind of through symbols and words is like almost how we like communicate with the universe and kind of like order up what we want out of the kitchen of life and say well no maybe like I would like this burger like that's done like a new one <laughs> Um, yeah, I think so okay. in the, uh, I guess if we branch this out just from where we are to the, the outer world, mm -hmm. where do beings like Thor, Allah, God, where, where do they stand in this, um, in, in this whole ecosystem that is witchcraft? Uh, I feel like most people who identify like as a witch or like practitioner of witchcraft probably are looking more towards like pagan deities or like a pantheon as opposed to like um like a paternal figure where a lot of i think modern religion really points mm -hmm. um and so i think it is kind of like a knock back to like before times um but really i think when we think about kind of like force, source, being the universe, God, goddesses, like whatever you want to call it, like, like the force that makes like us grow is something that we can't really like with our tiny like human minds, like fathom, like finite minds cannot comprehend like the infinite. Yeah. And so like with those different kinds of gods and even like kind of learning more about like Greek and Roman mythology and like, you know, Buddhism and Islam and Christianity and like Arthur and like Holy Grail stories. It's all like it's, it's stories and metaphors for us to kind of try to comprehend like the ineffable. Like there's like the thing and then there's like the thoughts that we have about the thing and then there's things that we say about the thing and the stories that we tell about the thing. And like never really captures the original thing, like no matter how we say it. I think that's kind of like magic of life. And so depending upon where you come from and like what you like, I think in modern day, we kind of have the ability to really kind of choose like, okay, here is at least a, a lot of us, like here's the God that I choose to worship. Here is this, and it's not necessarily worship, but it's like this entity like represents like these forces. And so like we think about like Thor and Loki and Freya, like each of those gods like represent something different, like within that mythology, but it's all like, parts of ourselves and like parts of being and like parts of the divine and like all these things that there's not really words for, but I think kind of ties back to like what stories do we tell ourselves and how do we tell them? Um, so like, for example, on my altar, like I really did like Persephone, but I think like the way her story originally told is like kind of messed up where she gets like drug into the underworld right by Hades. And there's yeah. this, super cool cartoon that I like called Laura Olympus and it's a modern day telling of the story where they have like the fates book and I heard this like witch on the internet lady kind of tell a different version of the story where it's kind of like a non-duality tale where like there was the original like goddess and she got so bored like being all divine and like a goddess all the time she decided to like, split herself in half and like not remember and so like it's even kind of points back to like Ishtar and like Anana, which were like ancient like um like Sumerian, I think goddesses or I don't know, way back in the day. Um so kind of telling that story from a point of like letting go of like victim consciousness, which um is very different than like actually like being a victim of like rape or war or genocide or these kinds of things. But like there are definitely times where we like give up our power and like give it to other people by like blaming or like having resentment or like being upset about things that happened 10 years ago. So the way she kind of told the story was 
like Persephone like chose to like go to the underworld and like kind of unite these two parts of herself. I think it kind of ties back to the scene earlier, but I felt like there's these like two different like, parts. I don't really know how to like have them put together. So I really kind of think of that like I am the goddess of spring and I'm like the queen of my own freaking underworld. And like like just having that little statue and remembering that story like helps me recognize and like okay like I'm blaming Canada for having to leave but it's not really Canada's fault or like yeah. I'm, I'm pissed at this person but it's like well like what power do I have here like what do I have control over like does it really serve me to like be bitter and resentful to other people like no like that's giving my power away and so yeah I think it has whatever meaning you want to give it and it's hard, I think, because sometimes we get taught like kind of these like beliefs from when we're kids about like the way things are. And sometimes those are pretty negative. And so I think also kind of like changing that narrative and kind of say, like, well, what do I want this source, this force, this being to mean in my life? As opposed to like, I don't know, thinking that there's like a malevolent God like watching everything that you're doing. Like that's that doesn't really serve me. <laughs> That makes sense. Uh, there is uh, there's a quote, I forget who said it, that says, um, each person has a different sense of romance and others' uh, sense of romance can be a little dark. Do you think you might have a darker sense of romance or a darker sense of what's beautiful because of your hobby and lifestyle? Um, I'm sure I do. Um... So, yes, <laughs> I think I'm a lot more, like, open to talking about, like, kind of more taboo things than other people. Um, so, like, in my work doing in-home euthanasia, like, I'm around death every single day, and, like, I feel pretty comfortable talking about it. Like, I still have some, like, you're my own mortality, um, but I think sometimes I forget that not everyone talks about those things all the time. Um, and actually, my husband decided to go back to school like a year ago to become a funeral director and so he's like a month from being done with that and so like we have pretty interesting dinner conversations and <laughs> probably not appropriate for all company um and i'm actually in the fall starting a podcast called dinner with the side of death so i'll have you on there too where we'll have conscious conversations at the intersection of science and psychology and spirituality oh. and yeah like, I, I don't like small talk you can probably tell like i like to talk about like these big ideas and like yeah. things and like um you know what are they really saying like in these religious texts and like um yeah so that sometimes does get me into like awkward situations i'm like oh yeah like this is not the time or the place to talk about about xyz <laughs> yeah so every now and then i'll blurt things out as well forgetting like oh the things that i would find normal like i when you brought up like trying to find out the meaning of like religious texts i i've been meaning to go and 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 drop some drop some lucy and read like the kim the, the king james version of the bible just to see like get into the mind of how people used to think back in the day i heard it's really fun to do so i'm very curious oh. i don't know how that goes hmm? You'll have to let me know how that goes. It sounds interesting. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> That'll be fun. But so yeah, that's something else I wanted to ask you about was the yeah. going into this specific, not easy field of veterinary medicine. Why? Why go into this? Is it because you think you're more comfortable around death and more comfortable around these types of things than other people, or is there another reason? Oh, I love how like sweetly like this ties back into like everything else that we've talked about so like when I graduated 10 years ago I had no idea like if somebody had told me like you're gonna be working from home and doing like 10 to 15 euthanasias a week and you're gonna love it I'm like what like how do I get there um yeah like when I graduated like I had um almost a public health master's and so I was going to go and work like in a slaughterhouse for the USDA and I was like I don't know that's such a good idea. So I ended up taking the um, the job in Canada, which was like, as mixed animal practice. We did cows and horses and sheep and goats and dogs and cats. And with doing that, like I got to help a lot of people with this at home. And I was like, why don't we do this all the time? Like, 
this is so much better than like being at the emergency clinic or even in the clinic. Like, I think the hardest thing was like watching people like walk out of the clinic with like the leash and the collar like in their hands. But, you know, sometimes it's like an emergency and like it does not go well and like it sucks no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, wow, like this is so different at home. And I remember thinking like it would kind of be cool to do this all the time and like not any of the other things. And right around that time is when it's so like 10 years ago is when the company that I work for that's um, based out of like Minneapolis and St. Paul was starting. And yeah. like in general practice, there's not really time anymore to do house calls. I think more people did that like back in the day because like they were seeing livestock and like, oh, here's like the farmer's wife's dog or like here's like the cat or whatever. And like that's kind of how small animal stuff started. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like Canada stuff fell apart and I moved back to the States and I worked at a small animal practice and I was kind of interested in like doing like acupuncture or like kind of like integrative medicine kind of stuff. And like, um, as a put, like my boss in Canada, like really wanted me to do like dentistry. And I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, <laughs> um, and I found out, and yeah, just really kind of started to like find I was spending more time, like talking to people, like trying to explain like what was happening, like with the diseases their animals have having and like, wanting to spend like more time like guiding them through like that process so it didn't feel like it was so like mechanical and so like how do we get people in and out and like I remember one of my bosses saying like hey like you're really good at euthanasia and I was like is that a compliment like I don't know like um but I found they had this um hospice and palliative care certification program and I was like that sounds really interesting and I don't know I just felt like in some ways like those appointments were really like they were so different than like the vaccines and the ear infections and spays and stuff like that. It was almost like opening up like a sacred space. And somehow like whenever I would like go into those rooms, like anything else that I was like worried about or thinking about like was gone. And it was like stepping into like a different world. And like, yeah, I think I just kind of realized like, oh, I am really good at this. Like, but it was just like being present for people and like helping that, like giving them space to like feel their feelings and like taking the time to answer their questions. And we ended up doing like a, um, like a special like hospice exam. So I could spend that time and also be compensated for it because <laughs> compassion is not billable. And yeah. you spend an hour with someone and you're supposed to be there for half an hour. Sometimes the people who uh, do the books get upset about that. And so <laughs> I really started to kind of do that kind of stuff more. And then I was like, I kind of want to start my own business doing this. Like, maybe I could actually do this all the time. And so kind of started to make plans to come back to Duluth and do that. And then met the person who owns the company that I work for now. And she was like, do you want to expand my business? And I was like, okay. And so I feel like, like I didn't like do spells to do that necessarily, but like, <laughs> like I, I visualized and like materialized and kind of imagined like, oh, maybe I could do all of these things together. And like, I can't imagine practicing any other way. And like, um, it was really hard doing like 10 to 15 appointments a day and like juggling all the stuff and like being pulled in all these different directions where like now, like, you know, I only have a couple of days, but like all my attention is there. Like it's super intense, but only for a little bit. And then like, I can kind of step back into my world and take radical care of myself so I can keep doing it. But like, I love it. And, like, people are, like, isn't that so depressing? Like, isn't that so sad? But I think part of, like, this magic of, like, changing words and, like, storytelling is, like, that's not the story I tell myself. Like, I'm witnessing, like, pure, raw love. Like, every single time. Like, it's super sad. And people just cry. And, like, it's so heartbreaking. But it's also, like, so beautiful. Like, it just it hurts sometimes. It's so beautiful. And, like, yeah, it totally sucks. Like, no matter what happens. But, like, if I can make a difference, like, a little bit at a time like I've helped thousands of families with this now and like yeah it like nobody wants to be at the emergency clinic and like people always say about how it just feels so cold and like so sterile like at the at the regular practice even if you've been going there for 20 years and you love your vet and you love everybody there like it's just like our families like you know, nobody wants like their parents or their grandparents or their family like to die like in a hospital like people want to be at home like where they're comfortable and like you can kind of take that time and so I don't know I feel like it's like magic and medicine in some ways and it's like it's so different than what I used to do but yeah I feel like it oh it's just like aligns so well and like yeah 
<laughs> there's, there's a quote that that just reminded me of from, from Vision from the MCU saying, what is grief if not love persevering? Mm -hmm. And I part of the reason why I got out of that field and yep. in the veterinary field is because I I didn't like all the sad like and so so to to meet someone that that work that chooses to specifically work in that field there's nothing but that that's mm -hmm. I I couldn't do that that's very very impressive. Um, Thank you. Is there any times where what you do you think like it's you ever see like spirits? I don't know how into like the supernatural you are, how well those two worlds kind of mix um, yeah. as far as uh, a soul or reincarnation. And I know that's like a lot of different mm -hmm. questions at, at once. No, oh, I love um, it. I'll take it. Okay. Um, I feel like I was very like resistant like to that idea like early in my career, but definitely like as it opened up to more of this, like I don't. I don't feel like I see souls with my eyes. Like, I don't think that those are necessary things that you can perceive with like your five senses. Uh, but there's definitely like, yeah, like supernatural feelings. Like, I mean, you know, like what the difference between like a living animal and a dead animal looks like and feels like. And like, like I am the one, like, like God is acting through me, like as I am like, pushing the plunger mm -hmm. like I'm right there and like like you can tell like the moment that that energy leaves like it, it is it is energy leaving and yeah like to watch and it's kind of like in fast motion too like compared to like a natural death like it happens within like a couple of minutes like you see mm -hmm. them like yeah fall asleep and like fall you know, you see like the changes in their eyes and like in their breaths and like I listen to their heart like as it stops and like sometimes like crazy sounds come out like as like that energy leaves and I've seen all sorts of like super cool like kind of creepy like stuff happen too like after they've passed and like I kind of imagine like this is the next place that that energy is going like I've had times where like more than once, like the radio will turn on and like a certain song will come on and people be like, oh my gosh, like that's like my mm -hmm. song. Or like um, one time, like I was walking out the house and the family came with me and we like, brought the dog to the, my car because we were going to the crematory and like this pair of like monarch butterflies like landed like on this little girl's shoulder or like, um, like we've been outside and like all of a sudden like a big gust of wind will come and it will just like hit a wind chime and like, I don't know. I feel like that's what's going on. Or like people, yeah. Yeah, some people will say that they, they see the animal's soul or they see it spirit. And like, I don't, maybe that depends upon like how deeply connected you are. Or like, I think it's one of those things too, where it's like the finite brain trying to describe like the infinite thing. And it's like beyond those five senses. And so it's hard for us to find words to really describe it. But yeah, like, it's like a sacred portal, man. Like it is, it is just kind of wild, like the things that happen sometimes. I think especially when like you're very aware of it, like some people are like super closed off and like, they're like, let's just get it over. Like some people like can't even like be present. And like when you see people really like feel the feels, like sometimes some like pretty, pretty cool stuff. Happen. And like, it's still sad, of course, but like, I think like that's magic is like kind of like tracing that energy through the system and like, yeah. Has, has there ever there been anyone like outside of the beautiful moments? Has there ever been moments that were like really dark, like you felt really ominous, like this doesn't feel right, like this is this is different? I mean, I've only done helped to do so many euthanasias. You've probably done a bunch. I figure you might have a inkling of that. Um, I mean, I would never like do one that like I didn't feel comfortable with, like if I didn't think it was the most like appropriate thing for the animal or like there's even been times where like I can get there and just tell like the person's not ready. I'm like, I'm not I'm not going to make you do this. Um, another thing I kind of think about is like some forms of pain are very difficult to be present with, like people who are angry. Um, sometimes grief comes out like that and sometimes I've had a few incidents where that's felt like that anger has been directed at me um, where it's like, this isn't, no, like that's, that's yours. Um, I have had one incident where um, the individual seemed like they were having like a mental health crisis and um, 
it felt like the safest thing for me. Like the animal was not unstable and it was not catchable and the person was having a really hard time. And it felt like the safest thing for me to do was to leave. Yeah. Um, and we helped that person um, the best that we could. And yeah, I think I'm really grateful for like the company that I work for too, because we have a lot of trainings about like communication and safety and like, even within my field, like, yeah, there's definitely like some heavy vibes sometimes. And sometimes like people say like really sad things. Like I think, especially with the pandemic, like people have become so bonded to their animals. And um, in some ways I think they're almost like represent like parts of our beings in some ways. And like a lot of people say like they're like their children. And so like, it's super sad. And I have had some people like talking about like wanting like to go with them or they don't know how they're going to live without them. Like that's really hard yeah. to live with. And um, people who like, there's been some situations where we've like kind of borderline like domestic abuse, like, and you can tell like, oh, maybe there's some like sketchy stuff going. And you really get like a very, very like intimate view of people's homes and people's lives. And like kind of that idea too of like our external environment reflects our internal environment. And like, I think some people's homes I go to like, I don't think too many people come to visit them and like maybe they wouldn't want other people to see their houses, but I think it's also like, it's a real act of bravery to ask somebody like me to come. And like most people don't want me to be there, not because there's anything to be with me, but it's me like their best friend is dying. Yeah. And so you really get like a glimpse into like, you know, like, like kind of the deep dark corners of some people's lives. And like, I'm like super like, perceptive person so like I notice a lot of things and like oh like it's always interesting kind of like the particular things like like objects in people's houses or like things that they're maybe trying to hide but like they're not hidden um or yeah just like how what's happening on the outside is a reflection of what's happening on the inside and I think it's helped me like recognize my pain more and, like when maybe like I'm acting out of a place of like fear or anger or sadness and just like really to be more like, compassionate for people and try to kind of get an idea of like oh sir I'm from. like it's got nothing to do with me like this is one of the worst freaking days of your life and that stuff comes out in all sorts of different ways and yeah sometimes it's very hard to be present with some of that darkness yeah I could yeah. I could imagine um yeah. I've never done, done like a house call uh at least not for that Mm -hmm. um typically we, we just said we just have an uh, animal cremated and you know we'd call them the ashes did do you guys offer that as well or did they always just like no we'll, we'll like bury our dog or our pet um, um give people the options i do work with a crematory that's local um and so it's a separate business but they can arrange like what we call aftercare like, with me so some people do choose to bring them there themselves um some people like we live in kind of a semi-rural area so some people who are in the outskirts like choose to bury them at home it's probably like 50 50. um yeah um they can pay an additional fee and I'll transport them to the crematory and then sometimes they'll bring them back to like the regular clinic or mail them or people can pick them up there and actually this is kind of interesting so my husband was a teacher for like 20 years mm -hmm. and he was like i'm done and um, worked at the liquor store for a while but then actually started working at the animal crematory that i work with they were like hey like we need somebody to go around to the clinics and like the animals up like do you want to do that because they're feeling bad because i was working in the big city so yeah. like, no but i know a guy and so my husband started working there and then decided to become a funeral director because they also own a funeral home. Um, but now, like, I have actually started to learn how to cremate people um, as, like, because he's almost done with school, like, they might need extra help if it's very busy. And, like, it's just very, very interesting, like, how all that goes down. And, like, you know, kind of in order to live in a polite society, like, there are certain things that, that happen. And it's Interesting, I think, too, like, kind of how, like, the evolution of, like, how we care for our dead has changed from, like, everything used to be at home and people would wash the bodies themselves and, like, many different ways to 
to care for remains. And then like, for the longest time, it's been like this kind of like secret, like behind closed doors, like embalming and like super expensive funerals and things like that. But I think there is kind of this change that's happening now too, to more like cremations and like people like hanging on the VFW, like come as you are versus the like $20,000 like religious funeral. And that's been really interesting too, to kind of see like, these parallels almost like between like the veterinary and the human world. And yeah. So yes, that, people can get them cremated. <laughs> yeah. Oh, as you're learning, do, is it true that the teeth don't get cremated? Like that can't be like that is they're just teeth are just made up of different things and they can't be, or can they? Well, so essentially what happens is so like retort is like a big, oven and so it's kind of like you know like if you left a pizza like in the oven for like a really long time like it would get burned and like people aren't pizzas but, like basically like that burning like gets rid of like all the carbon and like all the water and all things so what's left is like this organic stuff and so bones and like teeth are there but they're like very very brittle um and so like those brittle bones are what goes into like like a grinder essentially and then that's like the remains that you get back like the ashes okay but things that are like metal or like implants like like teeth implants dental implants like yeah. those cannot go they'll mess up the grinder because they are made of like different things yeah. um and so that like metal like can't go in there so people have like orthopedic implants or like like an artificial hip or like a fake knee or something like that and like so screws and like plates and stuff like that all has to come out before it goes in there and those things actually can get refined and turn back into their original like metals and be used again and so you do separate out like those surgical implants and things and then like the tooth implants because those also often have things like gold or um, I think palladium is another thing that they use. So the implant teeth and like these other artificial things like need to be separated out from the remains. And so very interesting. Is that something you do? Like, like, how do you do that? Like the the ectomies. Like, how do you remove like a metal plate from the head? Do you have to like make cuts and peel back and then? No. no. So like, when the cremation process is done, there's like a pile of all the things like in the retort, and then you use like a big broom, and then you catch it like in a like heat proof bucket, and then you oh, kind okay. of it out in a tray, and then there's like a magnet you pull through, and then um, it's like a tray with like a circle at the end, and so you kind of. So we put like the little bits of bone like down into the grinder and like pull those other things out. So none of that happens like before cremation. It's it's there <laughs> after. Okay. So I don't see the people, the bodies at all. They're like they're in a box when I put them in there. <laughs> okay. gotcha. Yeah, interesting questions. Like these are not things to think. And here's another interesting fact: like a pacemaker cannot go in the retort because it will like blow up. And I remember like, learning about this in vet school, and I was like, what happens if it does? And um, I hasn't heard this story about that happening, and it, 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 like, blows up. Like, it, like, messes up, like, the stuff in there, and, like, things that are very expensive need to be replaced because it's, like, battery. Um, so those kinds of things, like, funeral directors would remove, or, like, um, sometimes people have, like, pumps or, like, um... Yeah, pacemakers, like things with like electronic components, those do get removed ahead of time. So hopefully like the doctor will have made a note that those things are there or like before they get there, they'll do. But that's, those are the things that definitely should not go in there. And I know also like on the animal side, like, they ask that you don't put things like blankets or like um, stuff like that. Because that kind of like synthetic stuff can make more like chemicals in the smoke and like you have to regulate the smoke carefully and not put like not organic things in there because otherwise yeah. like things will come out and then the fire department gets called and nobody wants that. Yeah. <laughs> but even with, like collars and things like that, like usually you wouldn't send in there, but like they would kind of sort through and like, remove that metal so it doesn't like mess up the the bone grinder, uh, maybe what it's called. I don't know the technical terms. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. But I'm learning a lot today. Uh, so for some more, moving on to more some fun stuff. Um, I know you got a couple of tattoos over here. Do you have any 
uh, tattoos. I guess moving moving back to the which stuff that like I have an anti demon possession tattoo on my back. Um, yeah. Do you have anything similar that involves that? Um, like witchy stuff. You mean like yeah. Yeah, um, so I kind of almost have like a shirt. Um, I have like half sleeves and like a big back piece and like this chest piece. Um, and like these little birds, they say amorphity, which means um, to love your fate. And so that's kind of that idea of like, we can't really change the past, like kind of really like accepting and like telling yourself like a mindful story about like the stories you tell yourself. I do have like, um, there's like a goddess symbol that's like a moon and then like two crescent moons. I have that on my back and I have like a Celtic compass. This is like the first tattoo I got when I was like 17, like my mom signed for it when you could still <laughs> do that. <laughs> it's just like a little, little Celtic compass thing. Yeah, it's like a knot and I know like some of my ancestors were Irish and really got into like kind of like Celtic and like Druid kind of stuff and like have a tough time at that point. So I was like, oh, maybe this compass will lead me out of the way or whatever yeah. um yeah all sorts of like other little things like little animals and um i really dig ram das and to have like a little arrow and like it says be here now underneath it so kind of aiming for the future and like visualizing like what you want but like remaining in the present so it's almost like these little like friendly reminders of like oh yeah like <laughs> <laughs> um and there's also this book that I really like called um, Jitterbug Perfume. Mm -hmm. And there's this made up word in it called Erlicta, and it means lighten up. And so kind of like an, a reminder to like, don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like little friendly reminders. <laughs> That's good. Uh, in everything that you have seen, be it in witchcraft, veterinary medicine, is there any thought in your mind that maybe everything on earth that we see in the observable universe might just be ones and zeros like oh. either that these might what we do and say might not matter it might be predetermined and this is just computer code mm -hmm. yeah mind is an illusion so is time so is reality yeah everything is nothing <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's you know like we live our lives like especially in modern day like in our intellectual minds like that kind of that buddhist idea of like the monkey mind and like you know like what's what's real and like well i like um if you kind of pull back the veil behind like a lot of like ancient mythologies and religions and things like they're all kind of saying the same thing with different words and like kind of the idea of like we are the dreamer dreaming itself and you know kind of in that left brain world like we get this idea that physical form is real and like we're static and like things are unchanging, but like even like research on like psychedelics has shown like when you kind of remove that veil of the mind, like it's fucking chaos out there. Like it is all <laughs> and zeros. And like, you know, we're kind of this like, it's funny too, cause like in science they talk about this, but they kind of leave out the middle part, or, part where it's like, this applies to us too, where like really like everything is like electrobiochemical soup. And even though like, there's air here, like there are molecules everywhere and like nothing ever really touches anything. And like for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And like, yeah, it's like those things that like, hmm, it's the thing. And then what we think about the thing and what we say about the thing. And yeah, so it's hard to kind of like think those deep thoughts and not feel the need to like say lots about them. <laughs> I think if you go too far in that direction, like you might get um, committed to psychiatric care. Um, but I think people who really know this stuff probably wouldn't really care about that either. Like you know, uh, three meals and a bed. So you know, all, all is one, everything's <laughs> in the can, like everything's predetermined. Like this is awareness rising. And yeah. <laughs> I, um, I had this, uh, this woman on earlier this week or last week, Jen, uh, Pickett, who's a, like an expert on like reincarnation. Ooh. And we got, and it's it's very strange how some of these things get to go, and they almost coincide with science, like by like electrons, like looking at it changes it, and it just it's so strange, it's so so weird. I don't, mm -hmm. it doesn't. Um, you ever learn anything, and like as soon as you learn it, it's like this is making me question everything else. Oh my gosh, yes. I feel like the more, I don't remember who said it, but like, it's so true. Like the more I know, like the less I think I know. Yeah. And yeah, and like, yeah, like 
thing about atoms and like the solar system. And I remember that scene from Men in Black where they're like the aliens are playing marbles and like the galaxies are in there. Like I remember yeah. seeing as a kid, I was like, what? <laughs> like, why did everybody tell us this stuff? But yeah, like everything, like we are part of that like closed system, like global, global, like universal system. And like everything is constantly changing and like constantly moving. And like we suffer because we have this idea that things should be a different way or that reality isn't meeting our expectations and yeah, and even like ideas of like reincarnation, like are we individual selves? Like if this is really all one one thing, like isn't it just like the thing, like in all the forms, like in all the shapes? And so it's like, yeah, like more that world I was like, oh, I really have no idea what's going on here. And like, yeah, that idea of like oh, nothing matters, but also like nothing matters. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, like what's the story you want to tell yourself and yeah. I'll be a big fan of continuing acquiring knowledge. <laughs> so do you have anything that you want to plug? Anything that like, hey, I have a book coming out. Hey, I have like uh I have merch or I have you know, go like my Facebook profile, which I'll I'll totally put in. I think I put that on, on Facebook and on Twitter, so I think that's fine. Perfect. Um, I do all sorts of products. I've got a um, website, drmandador.com, doing some speaking and podcasts and writing. And um, on my link in my bio, you can find um, the link to my online store where I make candles and soap and other. Uh, I made a bunch of mystery bags, which is super fun. I made like, some nice mystery bags. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been doing more and more speaking and writing, and I am also starting my own podcast that will come out this fall, A Dinner with the Side of Death, as previously mentioned, and there's a on there, too, if anybody wants to talk about these kinds of things, um, can apply to be a guest. And then um, the other thing I do is there's this book called the Artist's Way, which is written by Julia Cameron. It's like a 12-week course in, like, connection, connecting, connecting to, like, your higher spiritual, like, creative self. And so on that link in the bio, there's also like a creative accountability group if people are interested in that course. And then a couple of times a year, I lead a small group through it. And so that's pretty fun. Too. So, have, have you ever thought about making NFTs for your website or NFTs like for your uh, for any of your businesses? I don't even know what that means, to be honest. Like when Mark told me, he was like, he's got a podcast about like cryptocurrency and Pokemon. <laughs> I don't really know about either of those things at all. Um, so I'm like a super basic beginner and like, I only know that that means non-fungible tokens, but I like, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> so I have not thought about it, but now that you mentioned it, I will think about it, but I don't really know <laughs> what sorts of thoughts to think about it. So um, uh, if you'd like to visit that bar, you'd be open to it. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're really, Fun because it's just basically bits of data on the blockchain that says, "Oh, you own this particular uh, picture. You own this particular physical, you know, digital, digital collectible or whatever it is, and you can give it utility." Saying, "Oh, if you have this, if you connect your wallet, you know, to MetaMask, or whatever, then you get like a a ten percent discount on my website, or you get a, um, you know, you get an extra entry into applying to be on the podcast type of deal, and just give it." It, it gets it can get a little complicated but they're a lot at you but that's, that's very complicated and i feel like i'm a bit technology resistant i'm like the oldest like geriatric millennial of all <laughs> uh, but i know what some of those words mean and i'm learning more about marketing and how to reach an audience and so that's definitely something worth looking into <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun it can be very lucrative uh but if you give something utility you could put it into because it's like a, just a digital asset, you could put it into the smart contracts that every time it gets sold, like you sell it to someone else and then they sell it, you get a piece of every time it sells. So if you make a limited amount of them and people keep swapping, that's it's pretty cool. I heard this is the wave of the future. And so I feel like definitely like early adapters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Um, Definitely. I, even, even if you don't want to like get into like your own business, it's just fun going on like the VV app and they're like, oh, hey, I can get Steamboat Willie or I can get an Iron Man. And and it's just, you know, they're they're licensed like from the companies. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I went a little crazy with it. Like, are you caught up with the Marvel Cinematic Universe? No, <laughs> I they, they have characters like Storm and, and they have uh, like Alligator Loki from the Loki series and uh, 
went a little crazy on buying a bunch of those. But Ooh, it's, that's uh, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, but thank you for for the hour here for coming on. This thank has you. been very exciting. I've learned a lot. And uh, any any other thing you wanted to say before you uh, before you bounce before we go? I don't think so. I really appreciate the invitation. It's been it's been fun. Okay. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you later. Everyone, talk to you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>